Do you know how easy it is to hijack a Kubernetes cluster? Apparently fairly easy. In this talk, Nico will demonstrate how easy it is to hijack a Kubernetes cluster, as well as how following basic security best practices can help protect you from being hijacked. He will also cover how implementing zero trust can prevent malicious workloads from being executed in the hijacked cluster. Nico is a Docker community leader as well as a GitLab hero, frequently sharing his passion for cloud native and Kubernetes at various conferences and user group events. Nico is available on chat as well as our, all of our other speakers, so do feel free to chat with Nico, other speakers, as well as the GitLab team members right now. Over to you, Nico. Hey everyone, and welcome to my talk, how GitLab can save your Kubernetes environment from being hijacked. My name is Nico Meisenzahl. I'm senior cloud at Defund consultant at Whitehack. Um, I'm located in, in Germany. I'm a GitLab hero, Microsoft MVP and Docker community lead. And um, yeah, my work is focused around uh, Kubernetes, containers, cloud native and DevOps technology. So um, yeah, the agenda for my talk today. Um, first of all, we do a demo and I will show you how easy it can be to hijack a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then we talk about um, how GitLab can help to prevent such attacks um, and we will um, yeah, round up with some container and Kubernetes uh, security best practices, um, some general stuff. Okay, um, so before jumping right into the demo, um, just some informations or details on, on the demo itself. Um, first of all, um, yeah, we will access um, a web application using our browser and then we'll try to inject some code into the container. Um, and basically then are able to somehow, um, yeah, inject even further from the container into the Kubernetes cluster, gaining some uh, privileges, um, yeah, higher access level and stuff like this and see what we can do. Okay, um, with that, let me switch uh, to my demo application. So here um, we basically have um, yeah, our demo application. It's a small application, small web app. The only thing the application is doing, I put in um, an IP address here, um, hit the go button. And what will happen is that the container or the application will run a ping command in the container and will output um, the details of the ping here. So pretty simple. Um, so let's see, we're doing a ping command. Um, we provided an IP address and we're getting an output. So it somehow looks that it's really just the ping command executed in the container. So maybe there are some security issues and maybe we can somehow um, yeah, inject a, another command. So maybe let's try to, to inject an echo. Um, so we're doing an, just the IP address and then a semicolon and then doing an echo, I was here. Let's see um, if it works. Hit and go. And once again, we're seeing our command, um, we're seeing our ping output, and we're also seeing the output of our echo. So here we're seeing an I was here. So what we learned, we are somehow able to inject another command into our application and getting executed inside the container. So pretty cool. Um, so with that, we are somehow um, can try a bit more. Um, so get back to the ping app and let's see if we can, yeah, Verify whether there's an, a shell or a bash available in our, uh, in our container. So this time uh, we're just keeping the IP address because we don't want to ping. We just want to somehow inject in the container. So starting with a semicolon and just doing a witch um, and bash to see whether a bash is available um, in that container and if we can um, execute it. Okay, also looks good. So output is bin bash, so we haven't been away and bash available under slash bin slash bash. So pretty cool so far. So with a bash, we would then now be able to um, yeah, further inject into our container by using a reverse shell. Um, so basically open up a shell in our container, but doing this reverse. So not as you know, let's say with an SSH or so, you're connecting to the machine and then executing commands, we're doing that the way around. So we will open up a port on a different machine, and then we will connect the container using ECROSS traffic to our, um, our machine. And with this, we might get access into container and get a bash inside of the container. So let's, let's try this. Um, for this, we of course need a public uh, access point. 
Um, let me just clear this one up here. Um, so basically, I just provided an, an virtual machine. Um, it's on, on Azure. We have a public IP for this one, so that we have an yeah, endpoint connect to. Um, here we'll use um, basically um, netcat. Um, we need to execute this with, with pseudo writes and just open up a port on port 80 um, with netcat. So now our application, um, our, our virtual machine is listening on port 80 on any IP addresses. So now we somehow need to inject the reverse shell and start it inside our container to yeah, connect to our virtual machine. Um, this is pretty easy. So here we will use um, this command. Uh, once again, we have a semicolon, um, then we're starting a bash. And in that, this bash, um, we are starting another bash, but this time we are redirecting the bash um, to a TCP address and port. And this is basically the IP address of, of our virtual machine um, of our port 80. We just opened up and basically redirecting everything um, in there. And if we're now starting um, or hitting the go button, um, it's loading and loading and loading. So somehow it looks like the application is broken, but let's see um, if it worked. And here we see, we now have a bash open. We're getting some kind of, of um, errors here, but it doesn't matter. We now have a bash. And if I'm doing a, a list, we are in our um, container. So now we have a reverse shell open into our container. And from here, we can somehow dig a bit deeper. Um, so let's see. Um, Basically, we are running on Kubernetes. Um, so basically, we somehow should have a service account available. So let's do an LS. Um, we have a service account. We are seeing our certificates. We're getting our namespace. And we have our token. Um, so let's try to somehow talk to the Kubernetes API server. Maybe we have some access rights. OK, so first of all, um, we need to expose some stuff. Um, first of all, we exposing a token, so just doing a cut on the token file here. Um, then maybe just do an echo to see um, if everything is fine. So an echo on, on the token variable um, looks good. So we have a token here. Um, let's do the same one on so certificate. Also doing a uh, cut on this one here. We also have our certificate, pretty fine so far. So let's try to connect to the Kubernetes API and see um, if we might have some access here. Um, yeah, this time we do not have kubectl at the moment, so we need to do it with curl. Um, so here we are just doing a curl, uh, providing a CA file. Um, we are providing a header, also a station header with our bearer token from the token above. And then we actually we're doing a get command on our Kubernetes service host and Kubernetes service ports. Um, those are uh, environments available in inside our container without exposing it at all, and then slash API. Um, so let's see if it works. Okay, we're getting some feedback. Um, at least we do not get in denied. Um, so at least we have somehow read access uh, on our API server in Kubernetes, which is pretty good because from there we might be able, um, yeah, to get some some further um, further uh, details. So let's see. Um, next one, let's, let us export, um, the namespace and see, um, which namespace we are running in or if it's default or if it's a, another namespace. Okay. So doing an echo on the namespace, we have the sample minus namespace namespace we are running in or the container, um, we high checked that is running in. Okay, cool. So let's try if we can list the pods in this namespace. So maybe, um, our service account, um, uh, has access to list them. Okay, so once again, we're doing a curl, providing our certificate, providing the bearer token, and here we're doing uh, a get against APIs, version one namespaces, providing namespaces from our variable above, and then uh, try to get the pods. So let's execute this one. Ah, okay, here we're getting forbidden. Um, so status is failure, Pod is forbidden, user system service account, uh, sample minus namespace default. So basically we're using the default account in the sample namespace. 
and this one does not have access to list um, yeah, pod resources in the namespace, sample minus namespace. And once again, we get the HTTP code, um, which basically tells us that we do not have access. Hmm. So we are not able to list the pods in this namespace. Yeah, but hey, every Kubernetes cluster has a default namespace. So maybe there was something misconfigured, some role bindings, roles are uh, somehow misconfigured or so. So let's try if we have access with this um, service count into the default namespace. So maybe this works. So we're doing exactly the same command um, and just, yeah, instead of providing the namespace here, we are just going to the default namespace um, and executing this one. Okay, this looks better. Um, so we get some feedback. We do not get a deny. And we somehow see a um, yeah, pod definition here. Um, so we have some pods available here. Um, pretty cool. Um, but it's a little bit hard to read. So um, let's see if we somehow get a, a nicer, nicer work and if we're able to somehow install or use kubectl. Um, so first of all, let's see which user we are um, in this container. Ah, cool, we have root. Um, so we have pretty high rights in this container. Um, then another, let's do another check if we can curl um, Google. This also works. Okay, so our container, we have write access and we have somehow access to the internet. So we can do an ECRS connection. So let's try to just download kubectl. Maybe it works and then we wouldn't need to use curl anymore. We can do kubectl, it's pretty nice and so on. Um, so we're doing the download here, downloading the latest release, um, making it executable and moving it to user bin. So let's see if this works. Okay, download worked. Um, so we sh now should have um, kubectl available. So then let's do kubectl get pods into the default namespace because we saw we have access to the default namespace and see if we can get some feedback. And here we go. We have another container, another app running in our default namespace. And we are somehow at least able um, to, to see it here. Um, so maybe let's dig a bit deeper and check out some of the configurations. Um, so here we're doing kubectl get. Again, output everything as YAML and crap for environment variables. So maybe we have some nice environment variables, usernames, password, or something like this. So let's see. Ah, okay, we have an environment variable which is called db underscore string. Um, so it's not uh, in Cleartix here, but somehow it's in SQL, it's, it's mounted into the container. Okay, hmm. so two more options. We either check if we have access to the secret, or we're trying if we can do an exec into the container and just read the environment um, variable. So let's try the second one. Oh, here we're doing, um, kubectl exec in the default namespace, just getting and crapping together um, the pod name here and then doing an um, envi env to get the environment uh, invariant variables and then doing a crap um, on the db underscore string. So let's see if we are able to exit it. Hey, cool, it worked. And now we have um, the environment variable, variable and the secret here. So with this, we can now try to connect to this database try to export data, at least read data, maybe dump the data and upload it somewhere else. Um, so pretty, pretty fast so far. Um, cool, so we have the DB string. So let's try something further. Um, let's try to schedule a container in the cluster and see if we are able to somehow schedule containers um, and uh, run our own workload in, in this Kubernetes cluster. We don't have access to. Okay, so we also know that it's somehow work that we have uh, able to, to connect to the internet. So let's try to get the uh, Ubuntu image from Docker Hub. Um, and of course, we don't would like to just have an Ubuntu running with, with root access. Also, let's try to, to run it with privilege mode. So with this, we would have even further um, access rights. And there we're just starting a bash and yeah, starting it in the background, then it's running and we don't need to care about updating the entry point and stuff like this. So just executing this one here, um, also looks good. So let's see 
if we are seeing um, the pot here. Ah, it's the Ubuntu pot we just launched 10 seconds ago and it's ready and it's running. Cool. So this also worked. Um, so let's do an exec here. And we're doing open up within bash in this container. So we now jump from our hijack container into our Ubuntu container. So here we have now a full Ubuntu available. We can install the tools and so on. And we also have privileged mode here. Um, so with privileged mode, one option could us do is we could mount the file system from our node, from the Kubernetes route, this pod is running on. Um, so let's do this one. We're having the mount command. We're just grabbing together um, the disk here from the node and mounting it into the container um, on slash TMP. Executing this. And now doing a list on TMP and see whether this works. Cool. Here we go, our file system from the Kubernetes node we are running on. And here we can now have many, many more access. So we're doing maybe an, an list on, on temp etc Kubernetes, so the etc Kubernetes directory of our node. And here we see we have an Azure JSON, for example, this one contains some secrets and, and client IDs and stuff, how the Kubernetes is talking to Azure. So we could even expose further into our public cloud environment, for example, uh, we're getting certs, manifests, and, and other information with those we could even further um, and checked or well, hijack our Kubernetes cluster, um, starting container outside of Kubernetes, um, maybe getting further access to the Kubernetes node and stuff like this. Um, so we are pretty gone, um, yeah, we are pretty far until now into our Kubernetes cluster. Okay, um, well, this was the short demo. Um, and basically I would like to show you how easy it is um, to get access if there is somehow an um, yeah, security issue in a web application and you have not a really good protected Kubernetes cluster. Then it's really easy to get further access um, yeah, to use privileged service accounts if they are available to, to get even further. Um, so and I'm not a security expert, so this is just basic stuff. If you really know about Linux and Kubernetes and, and, and security, you can go even, even further. So let's sum up. Um, so what have we did? First of all, we injected some custom code in the text box of the web application, played around a bit, and then we opened up a re reverse shell into the container. And from there, we used um, the privilege default service account um, to inspect secrets to schedule even a privileged pod. Um, and from there, we could have gone even further. Um, very important, um, with this privilege pod, we would be able to access the node, we would be able to access the control pane, or even uh, cloud resources, depending on the Kubernetes configuration. Um, so I know if we would have secured this cluster, um, most of the attacks wouldn't work at all. Um, but most of the time, time, if you are a customer site or a reviewing cluster, um, this is basically what you will get a pretty open Kubernetes cluster, and there you will need to make sure that yeah, it's running uh, secured and the application is also secured. Um, yeah, and this is um, where GitLab comes into place um, because GitLab has many features which can help you to print such of attacks. And this is, I would like to talk about now. Um, yeah, first of all, um, the GitLab features um, are combined in a, in a whole DevOps uh, strategy. So we have different DevOps stages like plan, create, release, uh, protect and monitor and some others, but all of those stages, um, yeah, GitHub provides you with nice features which can help you to secure your whole application lifecycle and also secure your application, but also your Kubernetes cluster. So let's um, yeah, get some details here. Um, for the create stage, basically just in, yeah, best practice, use pair pro programming. So make sure that the code you're committing or you're merging is the best as possible. Um, so make sure maybe you're finding an anti-pattern or something, um, your colleague um, yeah, working, you, you're working with together um, directly finds it, you can fix it even before somebody reviews the match request, for example. Um, and to be honest, 
um, the security issue we used in this replication, pretty sure a an, an senior developer would have found it directly. Um, second one, required match request approvals. Um, this is a feature GitLab, uh, of GitLab where you can make sure that the match request needs an approval before it gets merged into, into the main branch, for example. Um, so you can really make sure that somebody reviewed it. Um, this said, it's a uh, premium or ultimate feature. Um, optional uh, match request approvals are available in all um, GitLab versions. Yeah, then we have the queue stage. Um, with lots of uh, nice features we can use. First of all, we have secret detection. So we can, uh, GitLab verifies our Git history and um, yeah, find leaked secrets and passwords and stuff like this. So we make sure that we do not have any passwords and secrets in our code. And we have dependency scanning. Um, so GitLab can analyze our dependencies and find vulnerabilities and make sure we are fixing them um, or updating our dependencies. Um, this is also an ultimate feature. Um, we have static application secure testing, um, which analyzes our source codes um, for security issues. Um, also, this one would have found our security issue in our web application. So basically, we would have found this uh, bug in our, let's say, a CI pipeline, for example. Um, we have dynamic application security testing. So one step further, basically, GitLab analyzes your running application and tries to find some uh, security issues. Um, this one is also an ultimate feature. And then last but not least, we have API fuzzing, which also helps yeah, to protect and test web APIs um, by fuzzing them, um, also an ultimate feature. Um, but we have plenty of um, yeah, features and, and tools which you can use to secure and test our application even before it's deployed into an environment. Yeah, then we have the uh, configure stage. Um, configure stage can help us uh, scanning our containers. Um, so we can basically, after we're building our containers, we can scan them and make sure that there are not any security issues, vulnerabilities, uh, and stuff like this included. Um, and we have auto DevOps. Um, auto DevOps is a great feature which helps you uh, basically yeah, to, to reduce complexity and basically start with all the nice features um, I showed you um, and integrate them with a pipeline, uh, basically ready to go. So you get all the nice features out of the box. You just need to enable it. Um, yeah, pretty nice feature with auto DevOps here. But we have even more uh, stages available. Uh, protect stage. So here we basically have our running application, but in our Kubernetes cluster, but still GitLab provides us with features we can use. Um, for example, the web application firewall. So web application for um, basically monitors and, and filters HTTP requests and attacks. Um, so with this, also based on our web, uh, web app, uh, app we, we saw earlier, um, the code injection we did was a semicolon and maybe echo or something. This would have been found by the web application firewall and we could have um, denied the request before it hits our container. We have container host security. Um, also pretty nice feature. So basically it's uh, also based on open source and um, yeah, basically prevents and detects commands and, and binaries executed in our container. And so with this, we would have seen that somebody tries to run an echo or tries to run a bash in our container. And we could further deny this request. Um, and also container network security, which is basically the same thing just for the network. So with this, we could make sure that our container is not able to contact Google or to contact um, yeah, GitHub to download kubectl. Or even if we somehow got access to the database secret, we could have made sure, because this is a secret from a different container, that the container we are in is not able to connect to the database. Um, so even with the secret, we could have made sure with container network security that this container we are running in is not able um, to connect to, um, to the database. Yeah, um, so these are some of the GitLab features which could help you in this use case or could help you to protect your applications, to protect your Kubernetes cluster. Um, but basically uh, to round up with the talk, I would also would like to give you some container and Kubernetes, um, yeah, Best practices, best practices here. 
Yeah, um, basically, first of all, understand the manifest you apply into your cluster. Um, so the issue we had with having a default service account in Kubernetes, having somehow access in a different namespace, this is basically nothing you would do um, because you shouldn't share any service, privilege, uh, service accounts and even not if they have privileges to access the Kubernetes API. So most of the time I see this, somebody applying any yeah, manifest he or she found on, on GitHub or in any documentation which are not production ready or something, just copy paste it and yeah, implementing or applying some role bindings, roles and stuff like this. Um, this is how those issues um, come up. Um, you should deny untrusted registries. Um, so basically we downloaded or pulled um, the Ubuntu image from Docker Hub. So we could deny the Docker Hub or other registries uh, beside our own, for example. Um, we could have enforced rootless, uh, rootless containers so that we do not have root access inside our containers. Uh, we could have enforced, uh, enforced read-only file systems at runtime. So basically with a read-only file system, we wouldn't be able to execute all the stuff we did in our container. Uh, we could deny privileged container to make sure that we do not we are able to to mount or um, yeah work against our Kubernetes nodes, for example. Um, we could have denied our ecos traffic um, to not be able to talk to Google or to GitHub to download kubectl, for example. And even further, if possible, we could yeah just use distroless containers. So basically, containers not containing a Ubuntu distribution, not containing a shell and stuff like this. So just containing the parts the application needs. Um, with a distroless container, we wouldn't have ever started a bash inside our container to, to further get access to, to um, our Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, um, so basically this are some uh, container Kubernetes best practice, really just the basic ones, but to give you a better understanding what is important yeah, to run a secure workload um, on a secured Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, um, with this, my slides are available on SlideShare. Um, all the code and how to set up the demo application is all available on GitLab. Um, I also link to the GitLab features and if you have your any questions, um, feel free to con make, contact me via mail, via uh, Twitter or everything else. With this, um, thanks for joining my talk and have a great day.